Welcome to the Renegade Report. I'm Jonathan. And Ramon is present. There we go, that Jonathan. Took, that, that took, uh, it took a while, Ramon. I was a bit worried uh, that you weren't present uh, for a second. I, I, I blame this, this neoliberal patriarchal uh, software that I'm using that doesn't want to unmute the white man from speaking. Well, I'm not really white, but people think I am. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yes, often mistaken for being white. I wonder why but, that is. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know. But speaking of whiteness, Jonathan, the DA had a manifesto launch this week. And yes, so much whiteness. A lot of whiteness. Everyone there was white, thankfully. Everyone on stage was white as well. And even the singer that they brought along was white. So, yeah, yeah. They're, really, they're trying really hard not to be the white party, but I don't think it's working out for them. Um, indeed, indeed. Of course, uh, it, that's totally not the case. But uh, more importantly... The manifesto, have you have you read it? So I'm halfway through. First of all, it's 83 pages long. I mean, the yes, Communist Manifesto... manifesto. The, the Communist Manifesto is 36 pages. And that's like complete destruction of economy and society. So mm -hmm. when something's over 36 pages, I get worried. Well, I mean, when you need to have a capable state, Ramon, you really need a capable document. And really, would you have a capable document if it wasn't in excess of 80 pages? <laughs> I would love to have just like one page with like 10, 10 points they want to do. But I mean, you know what bothers me about this, the manifesto yeah? is that, I, I mean, I, I, I've glanced um, the document, I haven't properly read it. I've read the health section because that's uh, of particular interest to me. And what bothers me is it's, it's, it's not as unicorn and rainbow filled as the EFF manifesto, but there's plenty of stuff where they just say things and you're like, Okay, you can't just say stuff and be like, how are we going to do that? It's like on, on Twitter, one of the MPs tweeted out that it's, you know, the, it's bold. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, okay, um, you know, three-year-olds want to jump from the roof. That's bold as well. It's a freaking terrible idea. Um, but sure, bold. Um, yeah, but Jonathan, you know politics. Politics is a is a theme show. It's a cult. It's opera. You're not supposed to give, um, you know, ideas that are pragmatic and practical and reasonable because those are very difficult to sell. The washing machine powder has to be the best one ever. Uh, you can't just have one that cleans clothes properly. No, it has to be the best one, and that's what political parties try try to do all the time. I mean, yeah, I'm well, sure you well, understand they're, that. They're, they're very upset with me because I've criticised their health policy the one page of it that made it into the manifesto, uh, which is hilarious given the size of budget that gets dedicated to health in this country. But um, they're very cross with me because Wilmot James apparently um, put together their health policy, and that should mean something to me because Wilmot James apparently is now at the at University of Columbia doing public health. And many people consider public health and experts those words together to be a complete oxymoron. So selling your public public policy as coming from a public health background is not generally the best idea. But uh, um, I will try to give our uh, viewers at some point on YouTube a little bit of more insight into my feelings on this because I think they've missed the boat completely. Uh, although they're very upset with me, as I say, and they've also now sent me a long policy document, which is apparently the full policy. So the manifesto has a whole bunch of stuff in it. This is for health, and I'm sure it applies to everything else. It has a whole bunch of stuff in it that doesn't really speak to anything. And then there's actually a full document, which actually has a whole bunch of real ideas in it. That's the stuff we hide from the populace because, what, I don't know, they're too dumb to see the well, no, actual plan because then the, mani the manifesto would be 2000 pages long and then no one would read it yes Occam's but, razor but Occam's razor simple ideas Ramon I'm sure in their in their long policy document they would have something like we want to do this with healthcare and these are the 7000 pages dedicated to how we do that I don't need the 7000 pages just tell me what you want to do their manifesto there's many places not only health where they say these platitudes that someone in PR has clearly written up because it sounds like a good idea, and actually it just doesn't mean anything. All right, I'm already bored. Um, are you done? I, make, I make a YouTube now, video. Ma make a YouTube video for God's sake. So let's carry on. And today we're going to speak to two very brave individuals um, who don't have, who don't need seven thousand words to spread a message. They just need five on a poster. So this week we're speaking to Progress Essay. And they are Tammy Jackson and Scott Roberts. Uh, welcome, you two. Thank you for having us. 
the pleasure is all ours. So for those who don't know Progress SA quite yet, um, how would you describe yourself? So Progress SA is something that we started at the University of Cape Town two weeks ago. We would describe ourselves as a grassroots, a grassroots movement um, fighting for a fair future in South Africa. At least that's what the website says. But um, we obviously will do this through propagating certain ideas such as the free market economy, freedom of speech, freedom of association, academic freedom, um, the rule of law, and pretty much anything that we believe um, would be beneficial to a more free society and that would contribute to both economic and individual or social freedom in general. All right, that's fair. So now you put up a few posters at UCT. What, what sort of necessitated that action from you? I mean, what is the culture like in UCT where you thought that perhaps free speech is being stifled or academic freedom is being stifled in this manner? Um, so for the past few years, uh, both of us in some capacity have been involved in student politics. Um, I work at the university now. Um, we've both been at UCT for a while. Um, and we've kind of steadily watched as from student protests in 2015, as intellectual freedom has really declined on campus. Um, we've watched how people have retreated into themselves and become very, very scared to express uh, unpopular opinions and mostly liberal opinions. Um, and also, and most worryingly, a move on the part of management to start restricting academic freedom in the form of policy. Um, and that's the risk that we're facing now, is that this, these uh, limitations on academic freedom actually might become policy at UCT. Yeah, let's go back into that history a little bit that you allude to, because obviously 2015 was Roads Must Fall, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, there was that was obviously a movement uh, started at UCT, which ultimately led to Fees Must Fall, um, and the whole fallist movement and everything must fall, science must fall eventually um, came out of that as well, um, which led to what is now called the Decolonization Project. Um, which is actually taken very seriously in, in, in real university documents countrywide. Uh, there are even uh, uh, parts of schools and faculties that are being set up towards this, towards this process. But the original, the original sort of roads must fall movement obviously was trying to get rid of the statue that they didn't like and uh, what it represented. And that sort of um, was done in a way that was very anti-liberal. Uh, so, uh, we saw already the sort of roots of this almost fascist, anti-liberal movement that developed on campus in terms of intimidating students, in terms of using violent means to get uh, their point across. Um, certainly in, in Fees Must Fall, uh, there was artwork burnt on the UCT campus. Uh, there was... Uh, petrol bomb, as far as I recall, of the uh, vice chancellor's office at some point uh, or nearby. Uh, there were all these sort of things that happened. And, and do you think that this is part of what has sort of led to this point of moving the Overton window, so to speak? Um, so we actually think that the roots of illiberalism at UCT probably precede Rhodes Must Fall, right? In the past kind of 15 years, some people would say even longer than that, Humani the humanities faculty especially, um, and a lot of the departments in the social sciences have been overrun by either just hardcore structuralist Marxists or post-structuralist identity politicians, radical feminists. Um, so it's kind of been instilled in the academy for I had this experience going through a social science degree at UCT um, in the history department. People have started accepting that as the sort of like academic gospel. Um, and there's very, very little in the way of academic diversity in most of those departments. Um, so it kind of started there in the academy. And then, you know, you add it to a worldwide movement, um, which is entertaining identity politics and victimhood culture, and add it to some very real kind of like 
historical um, pain, I think that's a, a legitimate word, um, historical stress and historical anger, and it just blows up at UCT and becomes this massive thing. Um, and really had the power to change the culture on campus almost overnight. Um, and it, is, it has stayed very much in a kind of like suppressed state. Uh, or uh, Most opinions have stayed in a suppressed state since that happened. Yeah, and just to add to what Scott said, at UCT we have two main um, sources of information where students you know, can find information on anything from academics to cultures to anything and those two sources are or platforms rather are called varsity news and the NAC news now varsity news is um a newspaper medium which is funded by the university and the NAC news apparently is sponsored or uh receiving money from Iqbal so these two mediums have gained a lot of attention through the things that they or the ideas that they propagate through the newspapers. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, gender, cultural Marxism. And these are the only two mediums that students basically have access to. And what we wanted to do as Progress was provide an alternative source of information for students, perhaps not in the form of a newspaper, but online and through doing, you know, running campaigns and um, inviting different individuals to come and deliver lectures to students at UCT. So let's talk a little bit about this campaign. So I've seen a few posters um, with slogans on them, um, and the slogans are in front of a picture or a portrait of a student at UCT. Uh, some advocate for free speech. Some say that you know feminism is not man hating; it's about equality and things like that. Um, what what perpetuated the? Uh, how did you construct these slogans? And most importantly, uh, how much money did the Koch brothers give you to do this? So with those individuals that are on the posters, just note that they are students at UCT who share a lot of the same views um, as Scott and I. One day we then decided to come together and we basically just spoke about our different lived experiences at the university. Um, and most of it was related to how black students feel ostracized because they hold certain views at the university. We then came up with, or they themselves came up with um, little messages that they wanted to put on the poster. It was quite short, but I think that it was very powerful. It carried a very powerful message. And what that did was when we eventually put the posters up, it provoked a lot of people at the university, especially um, those subscribing to Marxist ideology and degressive identity politics. And that is exactly what we wanted, wanted to achieve. We wanted to obviously provoke people, but at the same time, spark a debate on campus where we are able to engage on these issues in a constructive manner and not in a destructive manner, which has kind of been, you know, the culture at, at UCT for the, for, you know, since 2015. Yeah, and so, for example, one of the posters... Um, a guy called Lindor, who actually founded Progress with us. Um, actually, all the mem all the people who are on the posters, uh, well, the majority of them are founding members of Progress and are still um, on the management committee running it now. And Lindor had this experience of, you know, he goes into a, a, a tutorial and says something that sounds a bit kind of like capitalist friendly or a bit liberal. Um, and the response from other people in the tutorial and possibly from the tutor as well, I, I can't remember the exact details of the story, was that he was a coconut, that he was a sellout. Um, and this wasn't the first time that it had happened, right? So, I mean, he gets told these things all the time and told he's not a real black, that he's got uh, some white puppet master controlling him and telling him what to think. And um, that was really powerful because I think, you know, white liberals like to, I mean, I do, I like to bitch all the time about how I can't have an opinion because someone would just call me racist. But in a lot of ways, uh, black students who are dissidents um, receive even more kind of racial hatred and abuse every single time they try to say something, which ultimately in the grander scheme of things is not that controversial, uh, right? You know, like nobody should be able to tell me what to say or think. Um, and that earns them uh, just slew of racial abuse from radicals on campus. Yeah, well, I think we've seen that quite often as well with um, 
with a whole bunch of people. Uh, I think I'm just thinking about uh, Sikhle, uh, who obviously a friend of the show and, and now has his own YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, he, he, he gets some of the most despicable and disgusting hatred online that, that I think you'll, you'll, you'll ever see. And, and far worse than, you know, being called uh, names or being called a bigot or whatever it is that, that the standard sort of terms that get thrown out. Um, so I, I think, uh, I think that that reaction was, was to be expected, but what, what about, um, the reaction that of course you are funded by the Koch brothers, that you are, um, right wing acolytes that you, uh, basically, uh, are just, uh, uh, by doing uh, Vladimir Putin's bidding uh, and uh, Donald Trump is clapping on? Well, we find that actually quite amusing. I mean, since Jogis launched, which is about two weeks ago, there's been so many conspiracies about our existence and who funds us. Um, the truth of the matter is that we received seed funding of 5,000 okay. rand from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. We have a local office here in Cape Town and we happen to know the project manager um, who's very really involved, you know, in a whole lot of local projects across the country and also the region. So we aren't funded by the Koch brothers, at least not yet. Um, <laughs> if they want to give us money, we'll take it. Uh, we'd love some money from the Koch Koch. Koch. Koch brothers, we'd love their money. Yeah, but so far we've only received money from FNF. Yeah, that sounds a bit okay. boring. I mean, we, we are funded by the Kremlin, so uh, we'll, we'll put you in touch. Uh, we've got contacts at the Kremlin for you. Um, so, okay, so the posters go up and then there's a sort of kerfuffle on campus. I see Facebook posts going left and right about mocking you know the people in the posters mocking the slogans and 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 things like that um has there been actually any sort of engagement from people who oppose you or maybe from academics or or the vice chancellor herself on the issues that you are trying to raise yes there has been some engagement so um on the first day we actually had um an online platform called or account other called UCT Just Kidding. It's basically a page where students can go and <laughs> interact with each other and, you know, just share uh, different views related to campus life and uh, just a lot of memes in general. And they decided to post some of our posters online and ask students feedback about what they think about the posters. Many of the feedback that we received was actually quite positive. Um, and a lot of the students you could see um, were actually quite liberal in how, you know, in the approach and the perspective that they were giving. They then also held uh, or created a poll on Instagram where they asked people what they think the true definition of racism is. And the two definitions was obviously the one that you, you know, you have on Google where they speak about racism being um, discrimination against someone from a different race. And then the second um, definition was the one about racism. In order for something to be racist, you need to have structural power or be white or, you know, the, the argument that regressives usually bring up. Um, and it turns out that most students voted in favor of the former, which was the definition of racism being discrimination um, against someone from a different race, so about 70% of students. And we thought that was a positive sign. And then we also had um, a few students DMing us and sending us messages asking how they could be involved. And this is something that Scott and I, we, we didn't really expect so much interest in this campaign. And I think it just shows um, the power of the campaign itself. Many students would rather sit in lecture theatres and be silent about these issues because they have a fear of being ostracised or called, you know, different names such as coconut or conservative or whatever so that was a very pleasant surprise for us and we're planning a whole lot of you know we're planning a series of lectures and events that we can and and another uh, really cool yeah article. sorry scott go for it yeah so we had a lot of academics uh professors emailing us or dming us on facebook um professors have Facebook apparently who knew, but they said, it's really, really great that you guys are talking about this. Um, and it's really important that you're drawing 
attention to these issues that are plaguing the university. And uh, someone from the philosophy department actually sent us a message drawing our attention to uh, the curriculum change framework, which is basically a document that's being circulated by the university, which might inform university policy. Um, and if it does, we'll, we'll talk about it a bit later, the ins and outs of that. Uh, it'll pretty much mean the end of academic freedom at UCT. And they were like, you guys have got a platform now. Do you want to take up this fight? We'll get behind it. And we think it's really important that students get behind it as well. Um, and almost, I think this was on the Thursday that we started the campaign. On Friday, we had our next campaign um, and it was launched and it was out in the public. And there's been a lot of interest in that. So things have kind of just fallen in place um, because of the way that people have been engaging with our initial campaign. Yeah, look, I mean, it's good to hear that academics are sort of getting involved at some level. Um, I've been quite disappointed with the academic involvement in general um, at, at, at all the universities. We've had uh, major issues at our universities for the last few years. And um, if, you know, if you were, go, were to go according to uh, the news, according to who makes the news, according to who's speaking out, you would believe that everyone on campus is... Um, you know, in support of the EFF, for example, and, and, and all of what they believe in terms of uh, how universities should be run, when in fact, that doesn't seem to be the case. But, you know, years back, we saw this at UCT when, in fact, Rhodes Must Fall stormed into a meeting and, and threatened a whole bunch of academics, and the vote from that came out basically 174 to 1 or something to that effect. Now, only one person was willing to stand up with a different opinion, and that really isn't representative of a university at all. And um, it's important that the academic uh, fraternity is, 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 is louder and actually willing to stand up for liberal values because I mean, that's what a university should be about. It should be about discussing different ideas. Yeah, definitely. And I think, we've, I think a lot of people were traumatized, um, academics included. I think, I mean, personally, I can speak to having been very traumatized from what happened uh, during Rose Must Fall and Fees Must Fall. You know, um, I mean, Tammy, for example, was like locked in a dark computer lab because she came to campus and refused to leave. Um, uh, like I was in an exam in which a fire extinguisher got set off. Uh, people were running around, like all over the place, like really scared. Um, you know, fire alarms get shut off. Uh, you see buildings getting bombed. So there was actual terrorism on campus. Right. And um, I think people were traumatized from that. And a lot of people just kind of retreated because of, of that. But um, you know, now what we're actually seeing, and especially with this curriculum change framework issue, is there is suddenly an existential threat to academic freedom at UCT. Um, and it's not just a threat in theory, it's a threat that you know, there is a specific document and if it informs policy, uh, academics in the biology department are no longer gonna be able to teach Darwin because all they are going to be able to say about Darwin is that he was a white heterosexist uh, colonizer. And his theory is just an example of power relations. Um, and, you know, people in the philosophy departments are not going to be able to teach Descartes for similar reasons. And when that happens, UCT will cease to be a university. And I think academics are now suddenly realizing like, oh, we should have actually spoken up earlier. We didn't. Um, and hopefully we can make them realize that if they take a stand now, they can actually stop something really, really bad happening. Yeah, Ramon, I don't really want to talk, but I, I just wanted to say that that basically sounds like expropriation without compensation of universities. Yeah, basically. Um, I think we can agree with that. But also, just to add to what Scott said, I think a lot of the achievements of, you know, protest or such as Rhodes Must Fall and Fees Must Fall um, and other radical movements, I think a lot of their success comes out of the fact that many students at the university tend to be very apathetic when it comes to political issues, not knowing how much the decisions actually affect them, especially the academics. So I think that part of what we want to achieve as progress is to bring awareness to ordinary students on campus to say that, look, we understand that you come to university to get your degree because you want to contribute, you know, get a job one day and contribute to the economy in a positive way. 
but this is something that actually poses a serious existential threat to the university and you can play a role in changing that if you decide to raise your voice. Yeah, that's very similar to what we're trying to do with this podcast here. Uh, we keep telling people, you know, it's not enough just to be a citizen and vote every five years. There's people in smoky rooms every day trying to take away your rights through the National Democratic Revolution or through expropriation of land or through taking away gun rights and things like that. All these things are not accidents. These are parts of a long-term plan that are coming to effect. And you can't just be as, as you know, a bystander and assume that everything will turn out all right because Cyril's in charge. That doesn't, that's not how these things work. Policy is dictated by culture and culture comes from the ground up. Uh, and if the Renegade Report and Progress SA can do it in their small ways, along with a few other institutions that are doing fantastic work, um, hopefully we can sort of change the mindset of apathy in this country. Um, but now, before we just speak about the curriculum framework thing, on your Twitter um, profile, you give a bit of stick to the to the vice chancellor. Um, apparently, you want you want to meet her uh, to discuss these sort of subjects. Um, what, if I may ask, if I may be a bit blunt, what thinks what makes you think that she's you, you know sort of you sort of entitled to her time? So, on the same day that we launched our social media and our campaign. We really posed a very simple question to the vice chancellor, and that was to ask, what are you going to do along with your administration to protect academic freedom at UCT? We then had a whole lot of people supporting us. And because we were hammering on this question, she then decided um, to block us on social media and ignore us for the duration of the week. This is something that I would say was quite patronizing to say the least because during the same week there were members of the EFF Student Command and the ANC um, Student Organization or SASCO as they call themselves who basically protested in front of Bremner where management holds their meetings and where your office is. And immediately she gave them the time of day. She entertained all of the issues. She, she sat down with them while they were having their lunch. She couldn't even answer one simple question um, that we asked her. And I mean, it's very ironic coming from someone who calls himself a deputy mother to all students when she haven't, you know, treated us with the respect that any mother would, you know, treat her own children with. And it's also ironic because, I mean, one of the messages we put on a poster was a quote of hers that um, she said during an interview on Cape Talk shortly after Prof Mayossi died um, tragically last year. And she gave this interview. And in the interview, she said that universities are no longer safe spaces for ideas. And you get labeled if you have a different view. And she really lamented this fact on Cape Talk. And all of us kind of listening to this, um, I mean, Tammy and I had a conversation about it at the time, and we were like, okay, so it's so great that the vice chancellor actually recognizes one of the major problems at this university, which is that if you say something that radicals don't like, they shut you down and they will label you um, and subject you to abuse, and it's mostly racial abuse. Um, so we put that up on a poster, and then we said, okay, so you know what the problem is, now what are you going to do to solve it? Uh, and yeah, she didn't respond, as Tammy said. She blocked us on Twitter, and we have sent emails to her office. Um, everyone was asking us why we didn't uh, try to speak to her through official channels. Um, we actually have. like, We we reached out to her office. They have um, acknowledged receipts of our communications, but nothing else has come from the vice chancellor. And then, it was funny that we were talking about conspiracies earlier. Uh, the vice chancellor herself launched into this kind of crazy conspiracy theory that we were trying to unseat her, um, that this was a big attack on her office because people don't want her in power. And then somehow the ANC and the Western Cape started tweeting that, um, you know, this is the IRR and right-wing organizations trying to get rid of a black vice chancellor. Um, and like nothing's further for her to step down. Um, and I don't think we particularly like care about whether or not she steps out, right? We just care about yeah. whether the administration is doing something to protect academic freedom. Exactly. Yeah, well, in fact, you're uh, trying to 
uh, protect the university and make sure that it doesn't devolve into something unrecognizable. And in fact, that won't, if you succeed in your mission, that won't bring um, Professor Paking down at all. It would, in fact, uh, raise her up because she'll be in charge of a better university, not a worse one. If she allows the university to continue down this road that it's going, um, she will likely be one of the last, if not the last, vice chancellors of UCT, certainly as a respected institution. So um, she would be well advised to at least try and listen a little bit um, to these voices. I also find it quite uh, interesting since she does call herself the mother of all students at UCT that um, your mother clearly didn't want to hear anything you had to say. Um, it's uh, interesting how that uh, only works one way and not uh, to the people she doesn't like. Yeah, exactly. But this just shows the culture at the university, you know, a culture where management continuously entertains a certain group of students who we refer to as the loud minority on campus. And they always have this idea that this loud minority is representative of every other student at the university. And this is its so false, it could not be further fr from the truth. And this is something that has been coming on since the 2015 Fees Must Fall protest, is that the university always entertains whatever they have to say because they fear that another building might burn down. Yeah, but unfortunately, minorities do dictate the future of societies. Nicholas Taleb wrote a great book called Skin in the Game, and there's a free um, essay online. It's called The Dictatorship of the Minority, and I recommend that everyone reads it, uh, where he elucidates the point that, um, you know, things in a society are determined by minorities, not majorities. Uh, and it's, you know, we, people like us, who, well, I'm not a liberal, but liberals and the right wing and free speech advocates, um, you know, have really thought that these ideas were self-evident. And, you know, very few have been fighting for them since 94 or since the fall of the Soviet Union. I need to find out now that uh, our enemies have been extremely strategic, extremely uh, well equipped with uh, propaganda, and they sort of have almost won. And uh, it took us a long time to wake up to the fact that these ideas are not self-evident, that it has to be drummed into people, that people have to be, understand them uh, for them to make sense so that they can fight for these ideas on their behalf because it will lead to a more, whatever, prosperous nation or more open society that we would like to have. So, I mean, I think it's good that progress is says around, of course. But it, don't you find it strange that, you know, a few students like you, I'm not sure how many you are in number, can do, you know, one campaign and then you have academics knocking at your door figuratively and saying that you have a platform now, uh, let's carry on with it in these various ways. I mean, what's prevented the academics from doing that in the first place? I understand you said they were traumatized before, but it doesn't seem very um, believable to me because if you stop fighting for your ideas in the public space, um, you will get beaten all the time. And that appears to me is what was happening anyway. Um, so just to answer your question, there's about eight of us uh, right now who are involved in actively organizing the campaign um, and a slightly larger group of kind of steady supporters. All eight of us are under 27 and most of us are students at the university. Um, I'm a staff member at the university and there's one or two alumni. Um, and yeah, it's there's nothing special about any of us really. We kind of just, you know, said we're going to stand up and give this message and not be scared to do it, um, which is a challenge, right? And I think there's a big problem with liberals in general. Um, I don't think this goes for the right wing. I think it goes for kind of like uh, moderate, sane individuals who just care about certain principles. The problem is that we're not willing to kind of take risks and we're not willing to be loud. I think liberals are both scared in some senses and lazy. I think academics, for the most part, fall into that first category of being scared. So I think some of them do have real things to figure uh, to to fear in terms of uh, not getting promotions or like pissing off management, because there's a lot of important people in high places who actually hold these ideologies and would like to see restriction of freedoms at the university um, on ideological grounds. Um, 
and there's a lot of ostracization, ostracism, sorry, in uh, in a lot of departments where academics will self-censor. We see a lot of self-censorship. Um, you know, they might actually have an idea, but they're unwilling to write about it or they're unwilling to speak about it because their colleagues who are much louder, much more vocal than them, will shut them down and ostracize them. Um, and they always tend to be radicals, right? Radicals just tend to be loud and vocal and unafraid. Um, it seems the more absurd your view, uh, the more likely you are just to be kind of like hull bent on pushing it on everybody else. Um, and then maybe there's this conversation to be had where people just aren't willing to do moral work. Um, and there may, might actually be like a moral problem in this country, in the world as, as a whole, um, in which people are like really unwilling to be unpopular uh, just to stand up for certain principles. Um, and maybe that's the problem with our academics as well. Well, I, I mean, I think if uh, they're worried about being unpopular, they should worry a little bit less. Uh, it seems that you guys became very popular overnight. Um, certainly uh, our podcast uh, shows that uh, these ideas are extremely popular. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of people hold them because really, you know, as we've been saying for a long time on this podcast is what's happened is the left has moved so far left and they've taken some people with them, but most people have been left in the middle and they they still believe in liberal values. And so they, they're they left behind in the middle and they're more and more having to side with the right, which they might not have done previously. Um, and and so there's a there's this bigger conglomerate, actually, <laughs> the so-called silent majority. And, and you, you've spoken about the loud minority. Um who, who's ever growing and, and wants to hear these ideas and wants them expressed. And, and you know, I, I, you spoke about the philosophy department. That's been a good department on the UCT campus in terms of uh, standing up to these ideas and being willing to express these ideas and being willing to fight back against the sort of cultural Marxism that has taken hold. Um, but there's, there's far too little of it and there's far too few people who, who've been willing to sort of stand up and, and, and defend uh, what, uh, what, it is that, what it is that these institutions stand for. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly it. Um, I mean, Tammy's had a lot of experiences. I don't know, do you want to like speak about them in council? and? Yeah, so what's happening at UCT at this point is that you have people being deployed to very strategic committees at the university. And these committees, you know, make decisions when it comes to academics, culture at the university and policy, etc. cetera. Um, so, I mean, if you go to the humanities faculty, which is basically like an asylum for the left at UCT, you'll find that, firstly, there's one thing that we want to interrogate interrogate as progress and that is to ask why is it that lectures are never recorded um, in the humanities department especially when it comes to politics and I think this is quite evident of the fact that many lecturers take advantage of this so that they can sort of you know propagandize their lectures to a point where you can't really tell whether or not you're at an EFF rally or an actual lecture on politics um, so the problem with a lot of the committees as well at the university is that you have radical academics or people with certain agendas coming into the committees and taking decisions on behalf of their constituency and not students or staff in general. Um, so a classic example is everything that's happening in the academic freedom at this point. Last year, um, a student organization called the Palestinian Solidarity Forum proposed that the university boycotts all Israeli institutions. And note that un the university has no formal relations with any Israeli business corporation or tertiary institution in any way. But they are pushing the university to, you know, take a political stand against um, the state of Israel. And there's committee is basically being funded by for pushing this agenda um, on the committee and also on council. 
So that's just um, a classic example of what's happening at the university is that these people take decisions without really consulting the university community at large. Just to, to go back to that recording issue, so you can record a biology lecture and you can record a chemistry lecture and you can record a math lecture, but you cannot record a humanities lecture. Is that correct? Um, not all humanities, but some departments or some uh, courses, but most of Let which... me guess, political science. Yeah, but most of which the lectures are quite provocative in what they say and quite frankly racist. Um, so, yeah, you can record things in biology, chemistry, maths now and then, but in the humanities, that's the department that we really want to put underneath the microscope and interrogate a little bit more. So let's talk about, about this curriculum change framework that you spoke about earlier. First of all, um, where does this document come from and what are the, some of the things that it proposes to change uh, in terms of curricula? So one of the things that happened in the wake of Roads Must Fall was that the institution started making moves towards so-called decolonization of curricula. And they set up a group called the Curriculum Change Working Group, um, on which sat some radical academics, uh, some student leaders from the various movements. Um, and yeah, I mean, they were, they were basically just kind of radical appointees, deployees. Um, um, just to interrupt, can I just say that the requirement for this um, curriculum change framework was that everyone who actually sits on the working group can only be allowed to participate if they are black or colored. Right, so they came up with this document um, to suggest how curricula should be changed at UCT in order to, to fit the decolonization agenda. Um, the result is called the framework document. It is uh, a few dozen pages of gobbledygook, to be quite frank. Uh, it took one um, lecturer in the philosophy department, a very, very well-respected scholar of language, almost three days to sift through the entire document and try extract the arguments from it. And he said most of them just don't make sense. Um, but the substantive suggestions that it does make, there are two really that we think are particularly vile. Um, the first is that we, what I've already spoken about is that uh, certain kinds of things shouldn't be able to be taught, right? And, and certain um, kinds of ideas which are classified as colonialist or heterosexist or, or reveal some sort of um, unacceptable power relations should be censored in some way. The other suggestion was that lecturers of the wrong color should not be able to speak on certain subjects at all because they don't understand black pain, they have the wrong epistemological perspective. Um, you know, a white lecturer cannot be teaching about African literature, for example, uh, because they are somehow incapable of transmitting the truth um, which is revealed in African literature. So they want to, the suggestion it seems to be is to introduce a color bar for lecturing in certain disciplines. Um, the university hasn't really clarified what the status of this document is. This is one of the questions that we've been asking management and they haven't given us an answer. We say, is this just something nice to think about and to debate, or is this actually supposed to inform university policy? And on the open letter we've written to the vice chancellor, the first point on that is to say, guys, please just clarify what this is supposed to do. Um, and then secondly, we want management to say that they very much support academic freedom and they oppose censorship firstly, and second, that they oppose the introduction of a color bar um, in lectures, because we're really worried about what's gonna happen if management hasn't opposed this, and Senate comes and votes on it, and this becomes university policy, um, and academics feel compelled to vote for this becoming university policy, either because they think it's the will of the majority of students, or because management has really gotten into their heads and told them that this is what they have to think. 
So I have, actually have it in front of me. So I'm going to quote from the last paragraph on page 13. Quote, faculties need to find meaningful ways through critical reflection to implement changes relative to their own desire to build an inclusive and socially just community that is well-placed to excel and contribute to social justice, redress, equality, epistemological repositioning, and innovation. Now, if that's not a steaming pile of shit, um, you don't know what a steaming pile of shit is, because basically what they're doing is they are using words to mean things that are not the original definitions of those words and actually using uh, ideology, the ideology behind it is that every single thing UCT does through its faculties must be for social justice, redress, equality, and all that other bullshit. Now, let me know how Pythagoras' theorem fits into that uh, or the evolution uh, of humanity or whatever the case might be. Um, this is really <laughs> what this is 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 taking an entire university and dictating what it must teach uh, and the terms are set by these people who have no mandate from the original from the academics or from students it's basically a dictatorship of thought it's george orwell's 1984 101 and I think it's extremely dangerous uh, if this gets anywhere close to being implemented. Yeah, exactly. We couldn't agree more. I mean, like, I had a conversation with Scott a few days ago, and we're talking about how Fees Must Fall has successfully managed to control every discourse that has ever happened at the university. And, you know, discourse that has gotten extensive coverage from you know, um, mainstream media in the country. And one of these methods that they employ is distorting language. And this obviously, um, you know, enables them to be at the forefront of the agenda and basically setting the weather to a point where the rest of us are always responding to it. And this is exactly what's happening um, in the curriculum change framework as well, is that the university is basically, you know, setting all of these, limitations on academic freedom which if it is implemented won't you know be academic freedom anymore because ultimately universities are spaces where people should be allowed to exchange any idea that they wish to to debate those things rig rigorously and the university wants to totally abolish those freedoms in the name of social justice and feelings and I mean, it's really interesting that you kind of refer to the war of language because, I mean, one of the things that we put on a poster was, I mean, Tammy referred to the racism debate earlier, but, you know, it was this message that, yes, black people can be racist too, right? Which doesn't sound like a controversial thing to say, but, like, in our humanities faculty um, and in most kind of progressive social science departments in, that, in the humanities faculty, I think there's a genuine belief that, Black people just can't be racist, right? And then you lose out on this entire possibility of moral critique because people can't refer to just say to another person, no, what you have said is morally unacceptable because it's racist. They're, they're precluded from that critique. And so the, the moral rules are just completely different um, for certain groups of people. And they've really exploited that to their benefit, you know? Um, like we see radicals all the time just engaging in these morally abhorrent behaviors. Um, and they kind of just seem to do that without any fear of repercussions from, from the university. And part of that is just because, you know, we don't have the language anymore with which to tell them, like, guys, that this, this is wrong. You know, it's, it's simply morally unacceptable. Yeah, I, I mean, I find a, a lot of this not really baffling because it's it's part of the it's part of the greater project that's that's been going on worldwide uh, in terms of trying to infiltrate universities trying to infiltrate greater society with these ideas um it's uh, it's it's basically classic frankfurt school um come to uh, its eventual uh, final goal and so i don't find it so much baffling as i, I find it terrifying in terms of what it could mean for the university um, and in terms of what it could mean for free thought in general. Uh, you know, as I've said, universities are meant to be the place where, where free thought begins. 
They're meant to be the place, as you've mentioned, Scott, where we debate these ideas, we talk about uh, all these different things. Uh, we, you know, Ramon often and I often refer to the battle of ideas, and 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 let's have the battle out. Let's have the best ideas win and the worst ideas lose. Um, let's expose bad ideas to sunlight because sunlight is the best disinfectant. All of these sort of, you know, free speech cliches, I guess. Um, and 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 universities are bastions of of that. And the idea that you would try and try and restrict uh, the thought and not only the thought but the history of thought um, <laughs> it, 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 it is ludicrous that this is something that is even being considered that it's it, it hasn't it hasn't been thrown out completely it hasn't been laughed at uh, it's it's actually been considered and has actually found its way into some sort of real policy document even if it's not enforced just yet yeah, and you know, it's really absurd in a historical sense as well. Um, you know, one of our massive critiques of education under apartheid is that the apartheid government restricted what could and couldn't be taught at universities. You know, what books could be read, um, what pamphlets could be read, what organizations could propagate ideas on campus. Um, and supposedly in the transformation project, we should be moving away from those kinds of really evil practices that characterize apartheid. And anybody who cares about the transformation of this country um, should be really, really scared of any form of censorship, right? Because now what we're just doing is we're furthermore telling uh, students, black students, white students, you're not allowed to think and say certain things. You're not allowed to be exposed to certain ideas um, and you're not allowed to learn in a certain way. Right, which is exactly what the apartheid government did, um, and the fact that that irony is lost on these people um, is is really really frightening as well. Well, I don't think it's ironic. I think it's part of the plan. Um, they just package it better than the apartheid government. It's all about power at the end of the day. And once we realise that everything we do uh, in terms of these these sort of formal institutions like the state or like the university or things like that, these are you know, pillars of power in a society that can be used to amplify messages of people who want to control others. Um, it's, you know, most uh, tin pot dictatorships around the world use the state and universities to spread their own propaganda and the media and things like that. Uh, to assume that we are different is, is, is naive. I'm not saying that you are saying we are different by any means, but for the listeners out there, there are people trying to take away your rights every single day. You know, start waking up to that fact because one day you'll wake up and you'll have nothing left at all to fight for and then yeah then you're lost as a person so in a democracy you start to fight for your rights essentially and people like progress they say are good examples of that so uh, in terms of the curriculum change framework is this coming down to a vote somewhere or i mean how do we how do people actively fight it especially the ones in uct so as Turkish, we actually just missed the date for submissions. Um, but like I said, a lot of students at the university are quite apathetic and don't know a lot about these things happening and the decisions that are being taken and being endorsed by the Student Representative Council, who is, by the way, being um, you know led by the EFF at, at UCT at this point. So the university tried to use this as an excuse for them not to engage with, engage with, engage with us, the fact that we, we missed the actual submission date. Um, but what we did was we wrote a letter to the vice chancellor. We also, uh, busy, we, we're also busy with a petition at this point where we have alumni, current students, and, and staff members at the university who are signing in favor and supporting, um, you know, our letter and opposition to this curriculum change framework. So if you want to see the open letter that we've written to the vice chancellor, um, you can go to progress.org.za forward slash UCT curriculum change. Um, and it's also all over our Twitter page um, and people are engaging with it. As of this weekend, I think we've got about 160 signatures um, and it's been up for about three days. Um, and many of those signatures are very prominent members of staff. Um, we've got about 12 professors so far and a number of senior academic staff. Um, and we just encourage anybody who's a UCT alumnus 
uh, where UCT students or staff member to please go and sign that letter. Also people funding the university, I think it's really important that they know what's being done with their money. Yeah, sorry Jonathan, before you jump in, um, because that's a very important point, the, the people who need to be convinced is actually the alumni, because the alumni are the ones who fund universities to a large degree. I'm not sure what percentage of their budget, but it's quite a fair amount. And if if you look at the US, so Mizzou had a whole thing, a whole, you know, riot uh, with social justice warriors, Yale as well, Evergreen State as well. And the alumni turned around and said, well, we've got to stop funding you. And these universities are actually struggling to to get new students in, they're struggling to get academics in to teach there because they actually haven't fundamentally changed the policies that cause the problems in the first place. So I think if you get the alumni on your side, the battle is 80% won. Yeah, um, I think the majority of alumni care about the same values as we do, right? And they don't want to see their alma mater becoming an indoctrination chamber for ethnic nationalists, um, which is really what the risk is here. Um, and our one of our main aims, as we said, is to let alumni know what's happening and say, uh, guys, you're actually doing a moral wrong by funding a university um, that plans to make these things policy. Um, and which is why as well, we just really want management to clarify its position. You know, it's unfair to donors uh, to maintain a sense of confusion and ambivalence about where management actually stands on something so fundamental. Um, and you're expecting people to give millions of rands to an institution whose management is not able to stand up and say, uh, yes, we think academic freedom is a good idea. And yes, we oppose the introduction of a color bar for lecturers. Um, very, very simple things. That's all they have to say. Uh, and your donors will be happy. Um, and we just hope that management takes cognizance of that fact. Yeah, I think a uh, good point around the alumni. You look at uh, the, the American universities, are basically sovereign funds that are funded by alumni and they, they use the uh, investment uh, earnings and the interest from those funds to do many things, including extend campuses, build massive uh, buildings and, and f uh, facilities, and, and also to fund students. Uh, one of the universities, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it might be NYU, which um, uh, recently said that uh, med school, I think, first year is free for all uh, people coming in because they can fund it, basically from that kind of fund. So. The South African universities are a bit behind that, but certainly funding is, is, is something to consider because um, I think, as, as we've said, the majority are against these type of regressive uh, policies within the university. But also importantly is that this isn't only a UCT problem. Uh, Rose must fall became fees must fall. Fees must fall spread to the entire country. Um, that caused an entire shift in government policy. Uh, and has really affected the way things are done at universities. We've had uh, unrest on universities ever since. Even uh, the beginning of this year, we've had problems across all universities, people burning things in KZN. Uh, Vits had to shut down for a day or two. UCT's had its problems. So these things uh, tend, to, uh, tend to, to spread like the virus that they are. And I think it's very important that an organization like yourself is fighting back against them, hopefully at UCT and, and hopefully elsewhere too. Yeah, we definitely are looking at expanding the organizations at other institutions across the country. I mean, the whole objective of, you know, the organization is to propagate liberal ideas. It's just that in this case, we feel like universities are obviously know the intellectual backbone of any country and so it's important that we infiltrate that space before these bad ideas that are being propagated begins to trickle down to every other institution within the country and UCT being the flagship university or at least that's what people or the public perceive it to be we obviously think that it's important for us to start driving these ideas and these values at the university so that other institutions um, you know don't have to go through these same ridiculous frameworks and protests around this. So yes, um, to answer your question, we are definitely um, in the process of um, expanding. Yeah, and um, yeah, good luck with that. Because I think I think um, you know universities were often seen as sort of 
the springboard, you know, for, for making adults, in a sense, and these adults will determine the future of countries. And if um, this document, the, the curriculum framework, uh, is an example of what sort of people will have in this country in the next five to ten years, uh, we need to be extremely scared. Um, so if if someone wanted to support Progress SA, uh, maybe fund you, um, what can be done uh, to do that? Have, have structures been set up or are you still working on that? Um, we are still working on, you know, doing all the administrative things that has to do with the organization. Um, so that will be finalized this week and the information will be put on our website. People can still follow us on Twitter at Progress RSA or you can check out our website, which is www.progress.org.today. Or you can also follow us on Facebook, which is Progress SA. But we are quite um, active on Twitter, so that's probably the best place to follow us. But if you're looking for more information related to the wider objective of the organization, we suggest that you um, get into contact with us or just go and check out our website. Sorry, Jonathan, before you jump in, I don't want to make to in, you know let the people know that this is not a political project. You're not affiliated to political parties. You're not doing this on behalf of a political party as such. It's really students trying to get a bit of influence in a university to spread ideas that they like. Yeah, part of the conspiracy theories that have been going around for the past two weeks is that we're being funded by the Democratic Alliance. And this couldn't be further from the truth. Just to reiterate our position, we are very much apolitical. We are not affiliated to any political party and we have no interest in being either at this point well yeah you're not funded by the da because you've done uh, more in two weeks than they've done in five years of student politics so yeah anyway jonathan uh no nothing much more from me but uh, just to congratulate you guys on what i think is an excellent project an important project and uh you know i, I do think the word brave gets thrown around a little too flippantly but you're on a hostile campus, frankly, and uh, uh, certainly amongst uh, the people who are particularly loud on campus, uh, they are particularly aggressive and they do not like this type of thing and they do not like pushback against their bad ideas. And I think it's excellent what you're doing and I do think it's brave and, and uh, strength to you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and if you need Kremlin funding, you know where to find us. Um, but anyway, uh, Tammy and Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will follow you with intrigue and interest going forward, and hopefully we can stop the total, total decolonization of universities um, in the near future. Not that decolonization is a bad thing. I want to decolonize this African state and make, you know, different states from this African state. But apparently that's racist for some reason. I don't know why. That's the most decolon decolonial project uh, I can think of, which is the most decolonized. But nevertheless, um, this is where we, do, we end today's show. So Scott and Tammy, thank you so much for joining us. And Jonathan will lead us out with everything you need to know about the Renegade Report. Well, obviously, you can uh, find uh, Scott and Tammy uh, on their uh, Twitter page at Progress SA. Uh, you can obviously find Roman at Roman Kabernack, myself at Jonathan underscore Witt. The Renegade Report, at Renegade underscore reports on Twitter, on Facebook, the page and the group. Come join us on the group. Have good chats. Uh, we've uh, even got a WhatsApp group. So now when you say they're on the same WhatsApp group, that's actually true. Uh, you can always fund us through PayPal. New website coming soon. Lots of cool stuff through there, including some merchandise. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Cheers. <laughs>